No. No. In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. And so, in keeping with that uh, procedure, bow your heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. And can you hear me now? Can everybody hear me? All right. And in Matthew 17.10, it says this, The disciples asked him, Why then do the experts in the law say that Elijah must come first? What is occurring here is the fact that the scribes and Pharisees are teaching one thing, and our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching something different. And so the uh, disciples here get confused. They've been listening to the Pharisees. They've been listening to our Lord, and they're confused. And that just shows, uh, well, they're pretty ignorant because uh, here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's performed all these miracles, and at least they should believe what He has to say. But they've heard something different from the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and the uh, people who were experts in the law. And they had something different uh, to say about this. And that's because the experts in the law did not understand dispensations. And if you don't understand dispensations, you're going to get Scripture all messed up because we have to rightly divide the word of truth. And to rightly divide the word of truth means that we must understand what dispensations are all about. So they're a bit shook up now because the uh, religious teachers have been saying that Elijah must come before our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, comes. And that's true if they were living in the tribulation. That would be true because Elijah will come first. He'll be the herald of the uh, coming of the second, the second coming of our Lord in which he comes down and actually puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives. And that will be his uh, uh, time of his second advent. And so for the second advent, Elijah must come first. And uh, this is uh, a part of understanding a dispensationalism. And the Pharisees didn't understand it, and neither did the disciples. So they were confused, and they asked the Lord a question concerning doctrine. And at least they're interested in it. I guess you could say that much for them. And then in 1711, he answered. And this is an aorist act of participle. And uh, this means, and it's always uh, translated in the active voice, uh, that is, when he answered, but this is in the passive voice, which means the subject receives the action of the verb. And so Jesus received an answer. What this means is Jesus thought about it. Uh, They had a doctrinal question for our Lord, and he thought about it before he just came up with an answer. So he uh, thought about it. He knew all the doctrines. He had to put it together in his brain, and just as we do. And he received an answer. And of course, he had the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And we too have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And sometimes uh, we receive answers. Not sometimes, but if we're filled with God the Holy Spirit, we all the time receive answers from God the Holy Spirit. So this is in the passive voice. And what that means is Jesus received an answer. And just as we do. And he lived a spiritual life just as we do. And so we too receive answers from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus received an answer and he said, and we must notice that thought precedes the answer. Our Lord actually thought about their question so that he could answer it in a way that they would understand it. 
and some of us need to learn how to think before we speak as well, and that's the principle. And we all know somebody who just rattles off at the mouth and uh, they really don't think before they speak and uh, all kind of stupid stuff comes out. And, well, we laugh at them. We don't get angry at them, but that's just the way they are. And uh, so uh, he goes on to say, Elijah does come to restore all things. And... uh, The word first does not appear, if you have the word first in your translation, if you have a King James, I know you do, and that just does not appear, it's an addition. So Elijah does come, and it doesn't say does come first, it says Elijah does come to restore all things. And the Lord here is actually explaining two advents, not just one advent. There's the advent in which he came into the uh, cradle, as they call it. It was a feeding trough, a feeding trough in which he was wrapped in death clothes. That's the first advent. And then the second advent will be when he comes uh, to the earth at the end of the tribulation and administers the baptism of fire. And then in uh, 1712, he explains this to them in more detail concerning the first advent. And he says, I tell you, and I tell you, that Elijah has already come. You see, the Pharisees kept saying, uh, he can't be the Son of God because Elijah must come first. That's what Scripture says. And it does say that. And the fact is, our Lord will not come at the second advent until Moses and Elijah come first. And they will herald our Lord's coming at the second advent. So they were right, they were just wrong dispensationally. And when you're wrong dispensationally, you might as well be wrong in everything. You just got it wrong. And that's why dispensation, understanding dispensations is of utmost importance to understand the Word of God. The Pharisees didn't. A lot of people today don't understand dispensations. Therefore, they interpret some of the signs of the times as meaning the tribulation is coming. And that's because they don't understand dispensations and they don't understand that this age is totally set apart from Israel, and they don't understand that the tribulation is part of the age of Israel, Daniel's 70th week, and we are so separated from that, there's no way that we could ever know it, and there's no sign for us that it's coming. Why would there be? We're in a different time, and we don't need to know. And uh, if we did know, it would be a great distraction for us, because if we knew that within three days the resurrection would occur, some of us would go party and raise hell before we left the earth. Others of us would uh, sit down and pray or do something different, when you should just be living your spiritual life day by day and not change. And that's why we live one day at a time. And if you start predicting when the tribulation is going to come, you've stopped living one day at a time, as the song says and as Scripture tells us to do. And that means we're out of line. And a lot of people get so focused on the tribulation, they miss out on their spiritual life. So 17.12, And I tell you that Elijah has already come. They, yet they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever, and this is a correct, corrected translation, they did to him whatever their emotions dictated. Yet they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever their emotions dictated. And we know what happened to John the baptizer. He was beheaded, and he was killed. It was all on the basis of emotion. And um, and it says they, even though a king did it, they refers to the king's wife, remember Herodias, and she was very bitter toward uh, John the baptizer. And she was a beautiful redhead, and she influenced her husband to kill John the baptizer. And so he did. And it was all based on emotions. He loved his wife and wanted to uh, follow her desires, and he did. And she hated John the Baptist and wanted him killed, and so it all occurred based on emotion. And a principle out of this is the fact that when we let our emotions take control of us, uh, we're going to fail in life. And that is definitely true because emotions are unstable. doesn't mean we don't have them, and we can all appreciate emotions. Life would be very boring without emotions, and uh, life would be b- very boring if I didn't hear the star-spangled banner and have a tear well up in my eye. And life would be boring if I couldn't go to Mount Mitchell and appreciate the beauty of God's creation. Everything would be boring without emotion. But it always must be in response to thought. And uh, the best uh, emotion, and when it functions properly, is when you have a thought and your emotions respond. 
for example, you might hear someone say something and you agree with it uh, totally. And so your emotions respond. And so you say, Amen. Well, that's an emotional response. Now, we don't say that here when, uh, because it, it distracts and it brings attention to yourself. The reason why you just don't uh, blurt out amen as they do in a lot of churches, it's not uh, the, the only reason is it's distracting to others and because uh, when you do it, you're bringing attention to yourself when the attention should be on the message, always on the message and not on yourself. And a lot of people uh, have a sacred thing about amen. When you say amen, it's sacred, and you lift yourself up when you say it. Well, you can say it all you want when you're at home or whatever, but uh, in here you shouldn't because it's distracting to others. And I tell you, it would be distracting to me if everybody said amen because I, I listen to people, and then it would uh, break my train of thought. And I'd say, well, uh, but uh, that's what occurs today in most churches, not because they're really enthused about the Word. It's just that they like to bring attention to themselves. And if you think about it, that's all they're doing. They think it's spiritual and they're sincere, but they're way out of line. Uh, but if you get excited about something, the point is, you can get excited in privacy about the Word of God and you might say, Amen, Amen. And you might be listening to a tape or something and uh, you heard something for the first time and it really got you charged up and you said, Amen. Well, I've done it before listening myself, but I didn't say amen. I'd bust out laughing and say all right or something like that. Uh, it's just not my personality to go around amen, amen. It's just silly to me. Then in 1712 uh, that we just did, in the same way the Son of Man will suffer at their hands. And he's saying that the emotion, the emotionalism of the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, the emotionalism of the Romans, all of these people are going to uh, kill our uh, Lord. But, uh, of course, they don't murder him outside of his will, outside of God's will. And uh, this all it, uh, occurs because of Jesus Christ's volition. And nobody really murdered the Lord. It was just uh, his volition knowing that he had to die on the cross as a substitute for all of us. And the principle is emotions must be your slave, not your dictator. If emotions dictate your actions you're going to fail miserably in life. Then in 1713, then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. And they understood. He didn't even have to say his name. They finally caught on to it and understood that uh, our Lord was saying, hey, Elijah has come and it was John the Baptist. So they got straightened out on a doctrine and that's a good thing. And they understood it and our Lord was glad to explain it to them. And now in 1714 and following, we're going to see again the disciples' failure to apply the faith rest drill. They're going to fail again. And uh, that, that seems to be their modus operandi. But remember, they don't have uh, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit yet, as we do. And we can understand that they're not getting these doctrines. Well, they don't have a mentor teaching them these doctrines. And God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. They don't have that. We do. So we should be able to catch on faster. And when you look at these people and you say, well, I catch on faster than these dope heads, well, uh, then uh, you probably should because you have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And they didn't. It's nothing to really brag about. And although we can learn a lot of lessons from their failures, it, it doesn't become a point where we say to ourselves, we're greater than all these disciples because uh, Peter became so great, uh, none of us will ever touch him. Then in 1715, and said, Lord, that's recognizing a deity. Uh, when they, well, let's go in 14. 1714, when they came to the crowd, they, they, they uh, went on to the crowd, a man came to him and knelt before him and said, Lord, this means that the man recognizes his deity, recognizes him as the Son of God. It means he's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And said, Lord, have mercy. That means that mercy can also be translated grace. And this man understands grace. And uh, really what this indicates is that this man has been out of line, as all of us get out of line, and he understands it. He's not one of those who says, I've never sinned before, because he has. And he says, have mercy. An understanding of grace is expressed here. Have mercy on my son, 
for he is, and actually in the Greek, uh, the uh, true uh, transliteration or the actual uh, translation would be moonstruck. He, for he is moonstruck. And they always use this in the Greek as meaning he has a mental illness. He's a lunatic. And, and this is because of demon possession. As a result of demon possession, he has uh, gone insane. He's a lunatic. He's a madman. For he is moonstruck, mental illness. And they said moonstruck because uh, people would, on a full moon, uh, it's something about a full moon, I don't know, but the Greeks really were interested in it. And during a full moon, they would run around outside and act crazy in the middle of the night under a full moon. It just means that a lot of people who go insane, they can't sleep, and in the middle of the night, they just go crazy and uh, run around outside or whatever. You know, be a lunatic. That's what moonstruck means. And then, he, and what he says, and has it bad. This is what it, this is the translation. And said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is moonstruck, has mental illness, and has it bad. He's saying this, this guy is really under duress. For he often falls into the fire and into water. Uh, he's so crazy from his demon possession that uh, he'll see a fire and just run and fall in it and try to cook himself. And then, uh, and apparently he couldn't swim, so when he found water, he would run to water and just jump in it. And uh, uh, this demon was trying to kill this fellow. And this is an actual... Uh, Analogy. This really happened to this uh, man's son, but this is analogy and a picture of the earth under the control of Satan during the tribulation. It's an, it, that's what it is. And during the tribulation, there's a lot of violence, and this is a picture of that. And especially in the last three years, when uh, these things really get going in the tribulation. And that's a picture of the, what's going to happen in the tribulation. Now, this is the reason why this man's son is going nuts. It is because of demon possession. And there are uh, three different sources of illnesses. And we can categorize these in three different areas. There's physiological illness. Physiolo ph physiological illness. Uh, we could get, a, get the flu. Or we could have some other physiological problem. And it's all related to our bodies. And medicine can help in that area. And then there is psychological problems, also known as psychosomatics. And, and psychosomatics, uh, the people who have it really feel the pain. It's a real pain, and uh, they feel it, but the pain is a result of their mental attitude. The pain is a result of something going on in the brain. And uh, sometimes it's a result of lack of doctrine. Sometimes uh, the, even this uh, psychosis or the psychological problems occur because of the um, chemical imbalances in the brain. It's not always the fault of the person. I mean, if you've had your head cooked by radiation or if you've uh, taken too many steroids, I know of a case, a young uh, man about six years old, uh, he had a case of some type of disease that was rare. The only way they could treat it was with a lot of steroids. And if you get too many steroids, it will make you go insane. It will put you into what's called rage. And this boy became mad and went into a rage because of an overdose of steroids. And doctors did it to him, not his fault. And uh, it messed up his brain. And he's uh, having to be in uh, medical facilities even today because of the, the rage that this medicine uh, gave to him. But it was uh, needed so that he would live. If he hadn't had those steroids, he would have died. But now he's alive and crazy, which is worse than... I'd probably rather just die and go to heaven before God consciousness, but he had rage as a result of that. And so there's physiological reasons and there's psychosomatic reasons for illnesses. And if you worry all the time, and this is just by uh, application, if you worry all the time, if you're always under stress, it's going to show up in your physical life. And a lot of times, uh, stress is related to high blood pressure. Not all the time. I have high blood pressure, so, you know, and I don't feel too stressed out. But if I don't take my medicine, I'm going to uh, uh, turn very bright red and feel dizzy and maybe pass out and all that. Uh, but that's physiological. But in, 
So the point is, if you have high blood pressure, if you have an ulcer and all these physical things, it might be physiological. It could also be a psychological because uh, the brain often can control what the body, uh, what happens in the body. And uh, sometimes people develop bleeding ulcers from worrying all the time. And I had an ulcer when I was 13. It might have been related to worry or physiological things. I don't know. Uh, maybe worry back then, but I, I grew out of it. And so we all have these things, and it's nothing to hang your head about. If you have been involved in the psychological things, we're human, and we are uh, helpless, as it were, and there's uh, no way around it. Sometimes it's going to happen. And the third category is demon-induced illness. Demon-induced illness. And Satan produced illness in Job. We remember that. You know, boils broke out all over him, and uh, he was scraping them with a uh, glass and all of that. Well, that was Satan-induced, and he produced illness in Job. That's found in Job chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Job 2, 6 through 8 talks about how Satan produced illness. Also, in Luke 13, 11 through 16, uh, 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 Satan produced illness in which a woman had been sick for 18 years due to demon possession. And uh, no doctor, by the way, can heal a demon-possessed person, and a, or no doctor can heal it when you go, over, go into evidence testing. And if you go into evidence testing and Satan gives you an illness, no doctor is going to figure it out. And you're going to run around in evidence testing in a lot of pain, and you might go to all kind of doctors and... They're not going to know what's wrong with you. They'll probably end up saying that you have psychosomatics or that you have a, a problem in the brain. And that's usually the way it goes. Uh, but it's not when it's related to Satan. And Satan, Satan can produce illnesses that there's no cure for except when Satan decides to stop uh, using that illness. And in the case of the unbeliever, uh, the demon possession causes an illness. And then when the demon leaves the body, so does the disease. This often occurs in faith healing movements. And a lot of faith healing movements, believe it or not, are all related to Satan. They're on Satan's team. And uh, somebody will uh, be ill. Maybe they have paralysis and they can't walk and they're in a wheelchair. And the reason why is they're an unbeliever and they're demon-possessed. And then the faith healer, who is also in cahoots with Satan, will tell that uh, person, or will tell that person, be healed. And when that person says that, demon or, uh, Satan orders the demon out of the body. The demon comes out of the body and they're healed immediately. And it looks like a real miracle. And it is, really, a real miracle. Somebody told me I should stop saying miracle and say miracle. Okay, miracle. So, it was a real miracle for the demon to come out. But it's all Satan-induced. And that is part of demon-induced illnesses. And oftentimes, when you're demon-possessed, you have abnormal strength and weird behavior. And you cannot restrain uh, these people in any way. And uh, this does not... And also, there are people deaf and dumb and have paralysis in which they have been demon-possessed, and that's the reason. Not all cases, of course, are related to demon possession because a believer for sure cannot be demon possessed. We should understand that because we have the indwelling of the Trinity. No way we can be demon possessed. And then uh, when a demon when demon possession causes an illness, the removal of the demon solves the illness and solves all of those problems related to it. So then in 1716, this man talks about his son who has had this illness, and it's all related to the fact that his son was demon-possessed. I brought him to your disciples. This is what he says to our Lord. I brought him to your disciples, but they were not able to heal him. Now, we know Judas Iscariot could not because he was an unbeliever. But the other disciples, remember, the Lord had breathed on them from uh, John the endowment of the Holy Spirit, and that should have given them the capability. But they still couldn't do it because they did not learn the faith rest drill. And a doctrine was related to these spiritual gifts, and the only way they could use them is to have enough doctrine and, and use it uh, such as that. And then in 1717... Jesus answered, and now he's going to insult the disciples again. As, but actually, this is more of a phrase uh, toward the uh, Israelites, the Jews. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation. These are the Jewish believers, including the disciples. 
You faithless and perverse generation. Now, perverse doesn't mean they were sexually perverted. This means they were corrupted in their thinking. They were corrupted because when they studied the Word of God, they did not concentrate. They were corrupted because all the doctrine they had received from the Lord Jesus Christ had been distorted. They had distorted the doctrine because they didn't understand it fully and because they didn't concentrate fully, they would distort it. And a lot of people get a little bit of doctrine and start distorting it and acting like they know everything. But they were corrupted. And the disciples really thought highly of themselves, yet our Lord makes it clear to them that they're corrupted. Their doctrines that they've been learning from the Lord have been corrupted by their own lack of attention and meditation and thought concerning these things. And then he goes on to say, How much longer must I be with you? The disciples had been with our Lord every day. And they've heard him speak not just once a day, but many times a day. And they had been around the Lord all day long. And uh, he would teach them doctrine all day long and with a few breaks to eat, etc., as we've noted before. But sometimes they would go three days straight hearing doctrine, no food, and uh, just listen to the Lord. And obviously they got very bored and they didn't suck in all of it. And uh, so as a result, they were corrupted in their thinking. How long must I endure you? Now this, your Bibles might say suffering, and that's a, a, a good translation because actually that's what he's saying. How long, how long must I suffer you? And our Lord was suffering uh, because the disciples would not listen to him. Imagine if you had uh, stood up and made your voice sore uh, or made your throat sore by speaking all day long to these numbskulls and they don't get anything. And they don't ever seem to get anything of it. And they're always, and he's taught the faith rest drill, and he showed them miracles, and they still just, they don't get it. So he's suffering as a result. And uh, for anybody who's going to be a pastor, that occurs uh, because you want to teach it, and you want them to get it, and if they don't, there's suffering involved in it. And the Apostle Paul definitely suffered in this regard often. Because he would teach faith alone in Christ alone. Then the Galatians would go off and try to circumcise themselves to be saved. And he would get frustrated. And, uh, and it wasn't sinful what uh, the Apostle Paul got sinful, of course, sometimes when he went a little overboard in his anger. Uh, but our Lord, of course, never got sinful. But uh, he did suffer as a result. And he did have to endure these people. And it, it got... Um, Frustrating, as we would know frustrating, and frustration can be related to sin. Remember that. If you feel frustrated over something silly, it's definitely related to sin, but uh, frustration uh, related to these spiritual matters is just a natural reaction, not part of sin. So he says that he's suffering due to their lack of interest or due to their lack of metabolizing and applying the Word of God. Then he goes on to say, bring him to me. And you can tell he's just about had it with the disciples. And so, uh, first of all, he addresses them, and then he just looks at the man and says, or looks at the disciples and gives them a command, bring him to me. Bring that man to me. And then in 1718, then Jesus told the demon, that's how I knew this person was demon-possessed. And that's why demon possession is related to illness. And when you were first reading it, you might say, well, this person's ill, but I don't see anything about demon possession. Well, right here it is. Here's the demon possession. That's why this person was ill, and Jesus gives us the answer right here in 1718. Then Jesus told the demon to go away, and it came out of him, and the child was healed at that moment. And so demon possession is definitely related to physiological problems. And uh, in all of these faith healing ministries, if the faith healing is bona fide and legitimate, it's satanic. And some of them are legitimate. And sometimes if you turn on the television and you see some faith heal healer bopping somebody on the head and they're obviously in a wheelchair, sometimes it's a show, sometimes it's legitimate. Sometimes that person in the wheelchair is demon-possessed and Satan says, get out and the person jumps up and hops around. And you say, well, why would Satan bother doing that? Possessing people and then making them ill and then hopping out. It's a distraction to the spiritual life. That's why. And what is the fastest growing denomination in the world? The Pentecostal. 
and those who, in this country and in the world, and those who believe in faith healing, and those who speak in tongues. Why? Well, it's Satan, and he's a genius, and he knows how to suck people into that area. And a lot of these people have believed in Christ, but they get sucked into it because it looks so convincing. And they've seen a miracle. Oh, yes, they have. A miracle from Satan himself. And there's always that counter side of the spiritual life. And today, since there are no uh, miracles that any believer can produce, all of the, the remember what uh, Peter said, doctrines more impressive to him than miracles. And that is the way the church is gone. And what we have in terms of, of doctrine is far greater than any miracle produced or any miracle we could ever see. And that's the principle. And so a lot of these people in that faith healing movement, all of them, are in the cosmic system. Some of them are even unbelievers and demon-possessed and uh, functioning as pawns. And they don't even know it. Even the people possessed who were ill, and then they're healed, uh, they, th they thank the faith healer, but it wasn't the faith healer. It's just the fact the demon popped out of the body. It really does happen. I don't know how often, and I don't know if it's... a if most of it's hocus-pocus and a bunch of uh, sideshow like Hollywood, and I don't know if it, probably most of it is Hollywood-type stuff, but some of it is really legitimate. And it's Satan trying to take away people from doctrine. Then Jesus told the demon to go away, and it came out of him, and the child was healed at that moment. Then in 1719, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why weren't we able to cast it out? They had tried. The man came up to the disciples with the problem. And our Lord had told the disciples they would have the power to do so. And so they weren't able to do it. And now they ask him a question, a legitimate one, and one that uh, probably all of us would ask if our Lord said, you have the ability now to do what I do and cast out demons. And then when you try to do it, it doesn't work. You'd probably go to the Lord and say, why didn't it work? He said it would work. Why didn't it? And then in 1720, he told them, and this is a corrected translation, he told them, it was because of your little faith. And notice how many times he's told the disciples they've had little faith. And they do. And then he says, a point of truth, or a point of doctrine, doctrine Bible doctrine is truth, there are, there are false doctrines, but Bible doctrine is truth, and what he's saying is a point of doctrine. If, now this if is in the third class condition, meaning maybe you, mil, maybe you will and maybe you want. If, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and that's not very much, you will say to this mountain, go away, and it will. Now he's using the mountain as an analogy because he said, go away to the demon, and the demon went away. And what he's saying is, if you had faith, if you had just enough faith the size of the grain of a mustard seed, you could have told that demon, go away, and it would have went away. Nothing will be impossible for you. In other words, uh, their spiritual gift would function if they utilize the faith rest drill. Now remember, we don't have those spiritual gifts today. It was given to them for the construction of the church. And why? Because the church at this point, as it starts, it hasn't started yet, but when it starts, the church starts weak. And it has very few members. About approximately 120 people are members of the Church of Christ, meaning they believed in Christ. And then later that explodes, of course. And we've noted that earlier, what's going to happen. And what needed to happen here, because the church was so small, the disciples were going to be recognized later on as apostles because they would uh, produce miracles. And that's how people would know this is legitimate. You see, they didn't have New Testament Scripture, and they couldn't uh, listen to Peter and say, well, I don't believe Peter. Let me look up in uh, Second Thessalonians and see if Peter was right on that point. And they didn't have the Bible. And the only way they could see if he was right as if uh, he was performing miracles, miracles, or if he was uh, performing uh, or doing things that were spectacular to point out that he was going to be the a member of the church and build the church. And so miracles are for weak people. Miracles were established when the church was weak. And a lot of people say, let's go back to the uh, uh, first century. 
And let's go back to there where all in Acts, for example, where there was a lot of healing and there was a lot of hocus pocus, which was legitimate then. And there was a lot of uh, spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues. Let's go back to that age. That sounds wonderful. No, it's not. We have something greater. We have the reality of the Word of God, and that's what Second Peter told us yesterday, that the true power is in doctrine, not in miracles. And miracles uh, it actually shows a sign of weakness. And that's why our Lord said, an adulterous generation seeks signs and wonders. Because uh, they seek them because they don't have faith. And, and what he's telling them in 1720 is if you just had enough faith rest drill, you'd have been able to do it. Nothing is impossible when you have developed the faith rest technique. And I know that this is one of the lesser of the problem-solving devices, but it actually links all the others. The faith rest drill links all the other problem-solving devices, that is, from number 3 on to number 10. And if you have a strong faith rest drill, you'll be able to solve any problem in life. And we have more. And that's so that, uh, well, it just shows the grace of God. I mean, the really thing, the only thing that we really need, the faith rest drill actually would solve everything, every problem that you come across in life. But you'll grow farther, and you'll get to a personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for mankind. You'll eventually get to occupation in, in, with Christ, and you won't even hardly use the faith rest drill. You'll just be using these advanced stages. But that's for later. But when you're growing up, you need the faith rest drill. And even that will solve every problem that you're ever going to have in life. Every one of them. And when you worry, it shows that you have a lack of the use of the faith rest drill. And when you get stressed out, lack of use of the faith rest drill. Remember, adversity is on, on the outside. If you let it in, if you let adversity into your soul... You've just fallen under worry, anxiety, and all of those terrible sins, and therefore no use of the faith rest drill. So remember, uh, adversity is inevitable. It's inevitable. We're all going to go through adversity uh, probably every day of our lives. Something's going to happen to us. But uh, stress is optional. Adversity is inevitable. Stress is optional. And that's an excellent point my pastor made. Very excellent, and it's true. Then, in, uh, now I don't know how many of you have uh, Matthew seventeen twenty one in your Bibles. All of you do. Let's see. How about you, Darlene? No, it just skips on to seventeen twenty two. What's your translation? NIV. Well, that's right. Seventeen. Yes. It's wrong. It's not there. Scratch it out. If it's in your Bible, blot it out. It's not there. And the NIV obviously got it right. Uh, what, what happened is the Textus Receptus, that is what they used in terms of the translation of the King James Version. They used Textus Receptus, and a lot of that was corrupted. It was a later version. Uh, it was that uh, they had Texas Receptus in 400 A.D., 500. And uh, some of the uh, uh, Catholic priests got a hold of it and made a little addition. Some of them uh, were so impressed with themselves because they would fast and pray all the time. And they were so impressed with what they could do, they added this verse. It's a human addition. And the NIV got it right, and his Bible made an explanation. So it's known, and it's not something I'm making up. 1721 does not exist, so we won't even go over it. I mean, why do it? It's not part of Scripture. So we move on to 1722. Now, I didn't know that until recently, that that didn't exist. And then I was reading an NIV, and I saw 1720, and then it goes to 1722, I knew why by that time, but I was just amazed because I was wondering how many people have ever been reading Matthew and they just see 1720 and then 22 and they probably say, there's a typo here. That's really 1721. But no, there's a reason. So 1722. 
And this is where our Lord describes the fact that the cross must precede the crown. He's going to explain this again to Peter, James, and John and all the other disciples. And he's going to keep on explaining this to them because they don't understand it. They don't understand that the cross must precede the crown. They don't understand that our Lord must go to the cross and die as a substitute for them. They know they're saved. They know Jesus Christ is going to save them. They just don't know how. And our Lord keeps trying to tell them, but they just don't believe it. And we'll see this. 17.22 When they gathered together in Galilee, Jesus told them, The Son of Man, that always refers to Jesus Christ, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. First time he's mentioned betrayal, and that will be done by Judas Iscariot, of course. 17.23 And they will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised. Now what happens to the disciples? And they became greatly distressed. That's the corrected translation. And they became greatly distressed. What happened? They uh, looked at that as an adverse circumstance, and it most definitely is. They were sincere about this. They did not want the Lord to go to the cross. Uh, they had come to love the Lord being with Him personally. And uh, they loved the man. They didn't want Him to go to the cross and die. And they got distressed when they heard it. And very distressed. So they let adversity move into their stream of consciousness. And so they transferred adversity and distress in their soul. And instead of believing it, and instead of knowing that this must happen because the Son of God said it must happen, they become distressed. They fall apart emotionally. They're very sincere. And they're also very emotional. And sincerity plus emotionalism equals stupidity. And a lot of times, and especially young girls, and all of us have a tendency to be swayed by sincere people, but especially young ladies, because ladies are responders. And it's a natural thing. And they see a man, and he, go, and he begs on his knees, and he's crying, and he says, I love you, I'll love you forevermore. And they'll believe it because they'll say, well, he's so sincere. But that sincerity might be part of emotion, and that's unstable. And one minute... Uh, guess who are the people who get on their knees and cries the most? The people who beat their wives are the people who do that the most. And they seem so sincere. That's why the women keep going back to them. And they get the, they get the crap beat out of them. And they're all bloody. And then, uh, because the guy got drunk and stupid. And then, after it, she's all bloody and all messed up from being beaten half to death, then he'll come back and say, I'm so sorry, and cry and weep. And she'll say, well, I'll go back to you. And then everybody scratches their head and says, why do you go back to that idiot? And it, well, she, he was sincere this time. He was sincere. And then it happens again and again and again. And, uh, and you wonder, and it's called battered wives syndrome. And so it's a real syndrome, and it has to do with the fact that they put too much emphasis on sincerity and emotion. It's meaningless. And it was meaningless for these disciples. And they were sincere. And they were emotional. But they had no doctrine, so they were stupid. And now it changes subjects in 1724 to the temple tax. 1724. After they arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, Your teacher pays the double drachma tax, doesn't he? And he said yes. He didn't know that. He just had the right answer. I mean, here's a tax collector. And they say, uh, your teacher pays his taxes, don't he? Yes. You know, if you, if you said no, you get in trouble and go to jail. Now, that's the way it worked back then. It works that way now. You don't pay your taxes, you're in jeopardy of going to jail. But back then, it was even harsher. And if Peter would have had an answer like, I don't know, or if Peter would have said no, well, they would have arrested the whole gang. But he said yes. Because and, uh, it's funny that Matthew puts this in here because remember, Matthew is a tax collector and he knows all about the procedure and so this probably interested him. So he said, yes. And this indicates Peter was worried about whether or not he gave the right answer. Very worried about it. And we know he's worried about it because of our Lord's re response to Peter even though Peter doesn't even say anything to the Lord. So this indicates he's definitely worried about it. He's got it on his mind. And he's all worried about paying taxes. 
How many of us get worried about that? We'll see. We're going to see a point from this in a moment. We should pay our taxes, but we shouldn't worry about it, even though it might be hard to get all the money to do it. I know that, but uh, worry is never uh, uh, permitted. And without help, I wouldn't have been able to pay my taxes last year. So he said yes. And when Peter came into the house, Jesus stopped him. Now, Peter hadn't told the Lord anything. He hadn't told him where he's been. He hadn't told him that the tax collector talked to him or anything. He just walks in the door, and because it's on his mind, and because it's really worrying him, Jesus is going to nip that in the bud right here. Why? Peter does not want, uh, I mean, Jesus does not want Peter to worry. That's the point. He doesn't want a, a, a spineless worry wart around him. And if you're a worry wart, you've lost all your doctrine, you're always worrying about things, and you will fail in life. And, and Jesus does not want that from Peter. So he immediately stops him. He just stops him. He doesn't really interrupt him. He just stops him. And then he says, now this must have taken Peter aback, because Peter hadn't said nothing to the Lord, but it's been on his mind. And it might not have taken him aback, because if you have something on your mind, you might just all of a sudden start talking about it. And uh, people around you won't even know what you're talking about. I've had that happen with me. Somebody just think, sitting there and they look in deep thought and they just start talking. And like, what are you talking about? Oh, I didn't tell you about what happened to me today. And said, No. And then they tell you and it's something they're worried about. So Peter may have not even been taken aback when Jesus said this, What do you think, Simon? From whom do earthly kings collect taxes? From their royal family or from citizens. After he said, this is what Peter said, after he said from the citizens, Jesus said to him, then the royal family is free. That is free from paying taxes. What's this mean? Well, Peter probably still scratching his head and he doesn't realize that Jesus Christ is in the royal family. Jesus Christ is the son of David. He is the rightful king. He is royalty. The son of David. And the royalty does not pay taxes. Kings don't pay taxes. Their subjects do. And Jesus actually, as the king of the Jews, is exempt from paying taxes. And he could make that argument. And if they would take him to jail, if this was our Lord's purpose, he could say, I'm the king of the Jews. I don't have to pay taxes. They'd all laugh at him and mock him. But it was true. And he had the lineage to support it. But he didn't do that because he had a different purpose. He went ahead and paid taxes. And the principle is we pay our taxes. We have a responsibility as citizens of the United States to pay taxes, whether they're fair or not. And I know most of them are not fair. I know property tax is the most disgusting tax ever. It's not yours. And this country was founded on private property. It was founded on private property. And if you don't pay your taxes, the government comes along and takes it from you. It's not theirs. But when they put a tax on it, it's as if they own it. But uh, you have to be responsible and pay your taxes anyway, fair or not. And it's not fair. It's not, our our uh, forefathers would roll over in their graves if they could see some of the things that happened. But remember, we have elected representatives that we elect. It's our fault. And uh, we are a government still by the people and for the people, and the people elect the people, and the, and the people try to subject the people who've elected them, and, well, they voted for it, so you got to follow it. And uh, it's, it is, you must pay taxes, fair or not, and that's the principle. So, But what he tells him here is, I'm royal family, I don't have to pay taxes. But then he goes on, 1727, but so that we do not offend them but so that we do not offend them. And uh, one person got a chuckle out of that, and that's good. Remember, Peter's always worried about people offending other people. Our Lord's never, ever worried about offending... Well, He did offend people, but He never worried about it when He did it. Now, this is one time when He says, uh, we won't offend them, Peter. And why? It shows divine establishment. It's showing that uh, we are under the authority of our country. We are under the fact of taxation. Pay unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. So we must pay taxes. But so that we do not offend them. 
And when has Jesus ever been worried about offending people? Never. But why is he saying this in this case? Because it's divine establishment. It's something he set up in eternity past. Go to the sea and throw out a hook. Uh, Peter was a fisherman, so he would be very good at this. Take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a four drachma coin. Take that and give it to them for me and you. And so Jesus is going to not only pay his own taxes, but he's going to pay Peter's taxes. Now notice, Peter hasn't worked all year. I mean, he hasn't worked for about two years now. He's been following the Lord. I mean, that's work in itself, but it's a different type. It's not a type of work where you're going to earn money. So Peter hasn't been earning money, but he still owes taxes. The Roman system was different. Whether you worked or not, you paid taxes. And uh, I guess that kept unemployment pretty low. You see, today we got unemployment, and people lose their job, they get unemployment. Well, they pay taxes for it, uh, but uh, a lot of people take advantage of it and just sit around on unemployment till it runs out. And you can't blame them because they pay taxes for unemployment their whole life, so why not? Uh, but that keeps unemployment high. It keeps the economy from going as good as it could. And so the Romans had a different system, a better system. Everybody pays taxes. You didn't work, you still pay taxes. You hadn't been working, you're a bum, you're going to jail. And that's the way they did it. So, at, uh, so he paid the taxes. And at that time, this means, uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch... You know, it's kind of like in movies where they show one scene and now they're going to show another scene. Well, meantime, back at the ranch, the disciples came. These are the disciples except for Peter. Peter's out fishing. He's fishing for that money and he's going to get it from a fish's mouth, which is funny in itself. And Peter's out learning doctrine uh, by catching fish. And uh, wouldn't it be something if we caught a fish in Lake Hartwell and opened its mouth, and there's a $100 bill. That would be something else. But that's exactly what Peter's going to do, and it's going to remind him of the grace of God. Now, at that time, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the disciples came, the other ones excluding uh, Peter, to Jesus saying, you see what happened is that they got jealous. When they saw Peter was getting a lot of attention, and he's the loud mouth of the group, and, uh, and our Lord says, Peter, you go out and fish. And, and get this money. Well, they got jealous. They thought they should be the ones to do it. But what they didn't understand is that the Lord was teaching Peter a lesson. And he was out fishing, not for the fun of it, uh, but to be taught a lesson. And all these disciples, the other ones, uh, start to get in a, in, in a uh, type of fight with each other, verbal fight. And they've all uh, downgraded Peter now and said, oh, Peter's nobody. And, and, and that's because he's not in the group. But then they start arguing amongst each other. They get in competition with each other. Here's a bunch of Christians getting in competition with each other, and they say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Christianity is not a place for competition. We're on the same team. All of us are on the same team. And uh, uh, Peter actually learns how to be a good team player. That's why he's not there. These other people are even farther behind than Peter, and they're all in competition with each other. And if you've been to any other churches, uh, you've probably seen that. I haven't attended very many other churches besides a doctrinal one, and uh, for good reason. But I, I do know that what happens in a lot of other churches is politics. Who's the greatest? Who's going to be the leader? And they have a bunch of nonsense going on. And this is what they start. The beginning of the church, it hasn't started yet, it's about to. And what's going on? Competition. A bunch of nonsense. And what our Lord's going to do is uh, teach them that uh, uh, teach them something of doctrine. And Jesus, in 18.2, is going to use a child as a training aid. Now, we're going to get a lot out of 18.1 through 18.4, and then we're going to get a lot out of everything else dealing with children because it deals with child abuse. It also deals with uh, uh, humility, and we're going to have to take points on humility uh, because children are a great example of humility because they're under enforced humility. When a child gets out of line, you whip their butt, and they're under enforced humility. So the best place for us to be is under humility. That's what our Lord's going to make a point about then he's going to make a point concerning child abuse. And we'll have a uh, whole thing on child abuse. 
I don't know how long it'll take, maybe a while, but it will be part of the Matthew series on child abuse, and that will be upcoming. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things, so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and come to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.